In our headlines on this Thursday afternoon, April 11th, here in South Korea. Liberal opposition parties look to take the helm of the 22nd National Assembly following Wednesday's parliamentary election, which also saw a record voter turnout at 67% the highest in 32 years. And main opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae-myung welcomes the result of the race, calling it a victory for the people, while ruling People Power Party interim leader Han Dong-hun tenders his resignation, taking responsibility for the party's defeat. U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida share their condemnation of North Korea's hostile weapons ambitions while calling on the regime to return to dialogue. We begin on the local front today. The country's 22nd parliamentary election came to a close on Wednesday with victory for liberal opposition parties. Our National Assembly correspondent Yi Shi Hu starts us off. The counting of ballots to decide the 22nd National Assembly of South Korea is now complete. According to National Election Commission, out of 254 possible seats representing local districts, the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea took 161, the ruling People Power Party 90, while there was one seat each for the minor Semire, New Reform and Jinbo parties. As for the 46 proportional representation seats, the PPP Satellite People Future Party secured 18 seats, while the DP Satellite Party, the Democratic United Party of Korea, including candidates from the Jinbo Party, secured 14. From minor camps, the Rebuilding Korea Party, launched by former Justice Minister Cho Kuk, won 12 seats, while the New Reform Party, led by the former PPP leader Lee Jun Seok, won 2. This means that in total, the DP and its satellite occupy more than the majority of the new assembly with 175 seats. That's 58.3 percent of all seats in the parliament. Moving forward, the DP may have additional support in parliamentary procedures from 14 other minor opposition lawmakers elected, representing the Semire, Rebuilding Korea and Jinbo parties. Meanwhile, the PPP and its satellite will occupy a total of 108 seats. That's 36 percent of overall representation. The PPP may have support in parliament from three representatives elected from the new reform party. The DP won in many of the capital districts, taking victory in several key battlegrounds along the so-called Hangang River Belt. Traditionally liberal Tollado provinces and traditionally battleground Chungcheongdo province voted in favor of the main opposition. Meanwhile, the PPP won fewer seats in the capital region but did secure traditionally conservative districts in Gangnam-gu. Historically conservative Gyeongsangdo province also voted mostly in favor of the ruling party. This distribution isn't vastly different from the previous 21st assembly elected four years ago. As we've seen in the previous large opposition small ruling parliament, the opposition now has the opportunity to take control of parliamentary moves with its numbers, leaving the UN administration without the momentum needed to push through its objectives. Yi shi Arirang News. And political parties have shared their official response to the latest election result. For this, I have my colleague Shin Ha-young standing by live on the line at the National Assembly. Ha-young, let's begin with the reaction from the main opposition party. Sunny, following cheers and applause for exit polls yesterday, there weren't any new official remarks from the main opposition Democratic Party regarding the overall vote count, count until just a few hours ago. And around four hours ago, the DP leader Lee Jae-myung, who is also the co-chair of the election campaign committee, said that the results of this year's general election are not the party's victory, but the victory of the people. Take a listen. The election results are not a victory for the Democratic Party, but a great victory for our people. We will do our best to alleviate the people's hardships and resolve national crises. We will lead the 22nd National Assembly to protect the people now and open up a better tomorrow for them. His remarks came during the final meeting of the DP's election campaign committee. He began his speech by thanking the public for their support in helping the party secure more than its target of at least 151 seats. And he urged party members to remain humble and attentive to the voices of the voters even after the election. Right, and Hyung, what has been the response from the ruling party? 
Well, Sunny, up until 11 a.m., the only comment from the ruling People Power Party came from its interim leader, Han dong yesterday, who made a statement before leaving the party's headquarters after checking the early exit polls. And during the press conference on Thursday, Han announced his decision to resign, taking responsibility for the party's defeat in the election. Take a listen. The public sentiment is always right. I apologize to the people as the representative of our party, which has failed to gain their support. I accept the voters' will and reflect deeply. Therefore, I take full responsibility for the election outcome and resign from my role as the chairman of the Emergency Leadership Committee. Han stated that he takes full responsibility when asked about the cause of the defeat. And regarding future plans, he said he doesn't have any specific plans, adding that he will continue living with concern for the country regardless of his location or role. And during his speech, Han congratulated all elected officials, including those from opposition parties, and urged for politics that reflect the people's will. And right after Han's press conference, the PPP's Park jong also stepped down as chief spokesperson. That's all after this hour. Back to you, Sunny. All right, Hyung, thank you for that coverage. That was our political correspondent Shin Hyung reporting live from the National Assembly. Meanwhile, President Seo Gyal will humbly uphold the result of the latest parliamentary race. His remarks to this end were relayed to reporters earlier on this Thursday by Chief of Staff Lee Kwan Sop, who added the president's commitment to state affairs and to stabilizing livelihoods. Separately, all senior aides at the top office, excluding those in the National Security Council, have voiced their intentions to resign. Senior staff members include the Chief of Staff, the Chief of Staff for Policy and all senior secretaries. Prime Minister Han Dok Su has also offered to resign. The latest parliamentary race saw its highest voter turnout in well over 30 years. Our PNJ covers this finding. The voter turnout rate for this year's election was 67 percent. According to the National Election Commission, out of about 44 million eligible voters, nearly 30 million Koreans have cast their ballots at polling stations nationwide to elect 300 lawmakers at the National Assembly. This is the highest figure in 32 years, since 1992, when 70 percent voter turnout was recorded. In fact, the turnout for early voting, which took place last week from Friday to Saturday, reached 31.28 percent marking the highest early voting turnout for general elections since it was first implemented in 2014. Almost half of the early voters were those in their 50s and 60s, followed by those in their 40s and 70s. This comes after the ruling party and the main opposition party leaders have repeatedly urged voters to cast their ballots. Consolidation of support from a conservative party and a progressive party, that too is reflected in the voter turnout. It seems that it was important which side went out to vote more. The high voter turnout also comes after the country decided to disclose the real-time status of early voting ballot boxes to the public using CCTV cameras, further encouraging voters to cast their ballots. Peunz, Arirang News. In Washington, back on Wednesday, U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida shared their condemnation of North Korea's hostile weapons ambitions while calling on the regime to return to dialogue. Our Lee Sing jae reports. U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida met for a summit at the White House on Wednesday, where the two leaders discussed an array of issues related to North Korea. In the joint statement issued after the talks, Biden and Kishida reaffirmed their commitment to the complete denuclearization of North Korea in accordance with relevant UNSC resolutions, while also condemning North Korea's continued development of its ballistic missile program, including through launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles and space launch vehicles using ballistic missile technologies, which poses a grave threat to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. The two leaders also reaffirmed their openness to holding talks with North Korea. We both agree that DPRK must, must also address the serious human rights and humanitarian concerns 
of the international community, including the immediate resolution of the abduction issue. But, you know, the prime minister has just spoken to the potential of what his plans may mean. But welcome, I welcome the opportunity, we welcome the opportunity of our allies to initiate dialogue with the Democratic Republic of Korea. In their joint statement, the two leaders also called on North Korea to return to dialogue without precondition. However, the North has stressed that any summit between Kim Jong-un and Kushida will be held without discussions on Japanese abductees and the denuclearization of the regime. They also expressed concerns over growing cooperation between North Korea and Russia while calling for faithful enforcement of anti-Pyongyang sanctions, despite Moscow's veto of a UNSC resolution to extend the mandate of an expert panel monitoring sanctions implementation. During Wednesday's summit, the two leaders also announced an array of agreements, including upgrading their country's command and control structures, creating an air defense architecture between the U.S., Australia and Japan, and deepening people-to-people -people exchanges. Biden also stressed the improved relations between Seoul and Tokyo, saying President Yoon sung yeol decided to heal all wounds and start a new chapter of friendship. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Staying with summits, the leaders of South Korea, neighboring Japan and China are likely to sit down here in Seoul in late May. Now, this is according to Japan's Yomiuri Shimbun back on Wednesday in a report that claimed the summit may take place on the 26th or 27th of May. Trilateral summit talks were last held in Shangdu, China some four years ago, but have since been stalled owing to the COVID-19 pandemic and tensions between Japan and South Korea as well as those between Japan and China. This latest report by the Japanese newspaper is on par with revelations by a source to Arirang News earlier this month about a trilateral summit in the Korean capital city in May. Meanwhile, the Korean economy is expected to expand 2.2 percent this year. Now, this is according to the Asian Development Bank, and Seoul's finance ministry says this latest projection reflects that of the government here. Our Eun Jin has details. Seoul's finance ministry said on Thursday that the Asian Development Bank has maintained its outlook for this year's growth at 2.2 percent. This outlook is on par with what the government had forecast in December. The ADB also forecasts growth for 2025 to be 2.3 percent. Based on the ADB's analysis, Korea is benefiting from growth in the global artificial intelligence sector, which has led to a recovery in the semiconductor industry. It has benefited even more than other semiconductor powerhouses like Taiwan and China, where chip production takes up a relatively lower proportion of exports. The ADB also kept its outlook for South Korea's inflation this year at 2.5 percent, while saying that this figure would improve to 2 percent for next year. Meanwhile, for the Asian region, the bank has revised its forecast for economic growth to 4.9 percent, which is 0.1 percent higher than previously projected in December, and inflation is expected to come to 3.2 percent in 2024, before gradually easing to 3 percent in 2025. As for risk factors to economic growth, the ADB cited geopolitical instability in the Middle East, uncertainties of the monetary policy in the United States, as well as the unstable real estate market in China. Ian Jin, Arirang News. And trade figures for the first quarter of this year show Korea's hybrid vehicles leading a remarkable performance on the export front. Our Park Konu has more. South Korea has recorded a record-breaking quarter one for automobile exports in terms of value. According to data released by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Thursday, total exports came to 17.5 billion U.S. dollars, or nearly 24 trillion won, up 2.7 percent on year. The value of outbound shipments in March alone rebounded to just under $6.2 billion after a drop of $1.05 billion was recorded in February from the month before. The rise was mainly attributed to growth in hybrid vehicles. The value of hybrid car exports in March jumped 37 percent on-year to a record high $0.85 billion. In terms of domestic sales of hybrid cars, more than 40,000 units were sold in March, an on-year increase of 23.6 percent, despite domestic sales of all vehicles falling by 12 percent last month. Sales of electric vehicles were also up by 15.5 percent on-year, 
with total domestic sales of so-called green cars up 18.6 percent last month. And 365,000 cars were produced in March, higher than 2023's monthly average of 354,000, but down 10 percent from the same month last year. The industry ministry said decreased production was due in part to fewer working days and construction at one of Kia's factories. The industry ministry also said it would work to ensure a robust performance for the auto industry in 2024 to mirror last year when outbound shipments worth nearly $71 billion were seen. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. In other news, prospects of a slash in interest rates this summer by the U.S. Federal Reserve have been rendered unlikely, our Moon hye explains. U.S. Federal Reserve officials are concerned that inflation isn't coming down fast enough, and traders now expect rate cuts later in the year than originally forecast. On Wednesday, the Fed released the minutes from its latest meeting in March, which saw another freeze in the U.S. benchmark interest rates in the range of 5.25 and 5.5 percent. The meeting notes revealed a more pessimistic stance towards rate cuts from policymakers, citing uncertainties in being able to lower inflation towards the Fed's 2 percent target. Some participants reportedly predicted that longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, with others commenting that geopolitical risks could result in higher energy prices. After expectations that interest rates would be lowered in June, economists now predict that rate cuts could come in the Fed's meeting scheduled in September, given this latest commentary. The sentiment was supported by the U.S. Consumer Price Index for March announced by the Labor Department on the same day, showing that consumer prices rose 3.5 percent compared to the same month the year before. This is, in fact, higher than the 3.2 percent on-year rise seen in February. It's also the highest rise since last September, supporting Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments that it's a sometimes bumpy road to bring inflation down. With the U.S. CPI seeing three straight months of high readings, experts are saying that this might not just be businesses raising prices at the start of the year, as economists had previously argued. Following the Fed's meeting notes, U.S. President Joe Biden acknowledged that while there could be delays in interest rate cuts, he stood by his prediction that these cuts could come by the end of the year. Moon hye Arirang News. On a light note now, Korean authors of children's books are looking to expand their fan base as they partake in a leading book fair over in Italy. Our Che Seung shares their story. Recently, the international reputation of Korean books and authors has been growing. In Italy, at the Bologna Children's Book Fair 2024, the largest children's book exhibition in the world, many Korean children's book authors are invited to show their works to the world. The Culture Ministry in South Korea has doubled the Korean author exhibition space at the fair compared to last year. So, 18 Korean children's book authors can meet overseas readers and publishing companies in person to promote their work. At this year's Bologna Book Fair, Korean picture book author Kim ji who won the Bologna Ragazzi Award Comics for Early Readers with As You Drive, share her thoughts about the pure joy to be found in her book. Regardless of the situation, we should be able to run with joy as our engine and fuel. And the ones who understand this joy the best are the child readers. We adults should help continue building a society where children can experience joy. For 40 years, the Korean children's book author Lee Gumi has been comforting children and teenagers with numerous books. Children's life experiences like school may be different by country, but feelings of joy and sorrow and challenges are universally shared. I hope my work can bring them some comfort and give children some faith in humanity and hope for the world. The 62-year-old was listed among the final six nominees for the Hans Christian Andersen Award, the highest award in children's literature. The award, presented every two years since 1956 by the International Board on Books for Young People, evaluates the lifetime achievements of children's book authors worldwide. The announcement was made on Monday local time at the fair, even though Austrian author Heinz Janisch won the award. He said she was proud of being a finalist. It's an honor that judges showed interest in Korean literature for children. I hope this sparks more awareness of Korean children's books worldwide. I feel proud to be able to take a small part in spreading awareness. 
The government plans to strengthen the global expansion of K-Picture Books through appropriate local support initiative. The Bologna Children's Book Fair 2024 will run until April 11th. Che Su Hyung, Arirang News. Pet plants are emerging as popular companions among office workers and others here amid the hustle and bustle of city life. Our Chong Eun-joo covers this trend. Inside a round glass container are stones, moss and small plants. This is easy to maintain as it only requires spraying water once a week. I started bringing plants to the office to relieve the stuffiness and for interior decoration. The greenery has helped alleviate my fatigue and stress. More people are choosing to raise companion plants or pet plants instead of pet animals. People can enjoy plants through terrariums, which are plants grown in glass containers without additional expense or noise. Pet plant kits that are available include native moss and ferns to create a small garden or allow people to place succulents on top of wood with its natural green visible. People can enjoy carrying a small plant in a small stainless steel container that resembles a lunchbox. The types of pet plants that were previously limited to orchids or potted pines in the past are becoming more diverse to include moss, air purifying plants and succulents. Companion plants is a new term that means to gain comfort by communicating with plants like friends and goes beyond the traditional hobby concept. More people are seeking comfort by raising pet plants after the COVID-19 pandemic. In a satisfaction survey about life with pet plants, over 90 percent of respondents said it helped alleviate depression and loneliness. Reflecting such situations, sales of companion plant-related products in 2023 increased more than eightfold compared to 2020. This indicates that the number of people who cherish and care for plants as they would for pets is growing. Tong eun Arirang News. Good afternoon. It's a cloudy day for most parts of the country with some rain. Rain is going away in the capital, while Gangwon-do province could see rain through the late afternoon. Meanwhile, Jeollado provinces and Jeju will see a passing rain during the day today. It really won't rain much with one to five millimeters of sprinkles in the forecast. But brace for strong winds and thunderstorms if you're in Jeollado and nearby areas today. Today's rain will not help much to ease the dryness in the air with a dry advisory remaining in place for Seoul and surrounding areas. Wet clouds will just hide the sunshine behind the clouds. But southeast regions could see a glimpse of sunny skies and daytime highs are similar to yesterday, hovering around 20 degrees Celsius in most parts of the country. But sunshine and warmth return tomorrow, and by Sunday, Seoul will see a high of 27 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, rain is in the forecast for Jeju from tomorrow into Sunday. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. And those are the headlines at this hour here in Korea. We return with our panel session in a few minutes, so do stay with us.